Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. In the early hours of December 31st, 1969 in Pennsylvania, three men broke into the home of labor organizer Jock Yablonski of the United Mine Workers of America, and they murdered Jock Yablonski, his wife Margaret, and their child Charlotte. The killings were ordered by Tony Boyle, the longtime president of the union. It was one of the most notorious acts within the labor movement of the 20th century, but it also galvanized Yablonski's supporters to perform the first successful rank-and-file takeover of a major labor union in U.S. history. Today we're going to be in conversation about this history. My guest is Mark A. Bradley. Mark A. Bradley is the author of the book Blood Runs Coal, The Oblonsky Murders and the Battle for the United Mine Workers of America. Mark Bradley currently is the director of the Information Security Oversight Office of the National Archives and Records Administration. He's a former attorney within the Justice Department, and he's also a former CIA officer. He joins me via Zoom. Mark Bradley, it's a great pleasure, sir, to welcome you to this radio program. Thank you, Mitch. I'm delighted to be here. Let me ask you a little bit, and we won't we won't dwell on this, but I am interested a little bit in your background as a former CIA officer, and my understanding is what you do at the National Archives and Records Administration is also dealing with classified information. So somebody with a, with a bit of your background, you'll correct me there if I'm wrong, but, but with, with your kind of background, how, how do you end up getting interested in this labor history? Well, I studied history as an undergraduate in college and then picked up a master's in history at Oxford and have always considered myself kind of an amateur historian. And the Yablonski story appealed to me not only because of the history, but also because of the legal aspects, because I'm a lawyer. So it was kind of a perfect storm, as they say, in, in, in the writing world, that it, 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 uh, it, it satisfied both interests of mine. And, and why the Yablonsky murder? What was it about this that it appealed to you? You know, it was the last political assassination of the 1960s, a decade that ran red with them. I mean, I'm old enough to remember. I remember being sent home from grade school when uh, JFK was assassinated. I, I remember when Malcolm X was murdered. I remember uh, Martin Luther King and, and Robert Kennedy. And so this was kind of the last violent punctuation mark of an extraordinarily uh, unsettled decade. And I wanted to tell the story because it had been kind of lost. I mean, there had been a, a spate of books written about it. Uh, the murder took place in New Year's Eve, 1969. And there had been a spate of books written uh, during the time of the trials of the, the uh, defendants, they were all written by journalists and, and none of them had any footnotes and none of them at the time, and they couldn't have uh, tried to put this murder or these murders at plural into any type of historical context. So I thought it was time for somebody to step back. It had been almost 50 years by the time I started writing this thing to s step back and, and have a look and try to frame these, these murders in their historical context. And I found out that that's one of the advantages of living here in, in the Washington, D.C. metro area. We have uh, the Library of Congress. And I uh, was finishing up the footnotes on my first book and was looking at the uh, Library of Congress's uh, manuscript division manifest. And I noticed they had gotten in 26 boxes on something called the Joseph A. Yablonski legal case. And that piqued my interest. I asked to see a couple of the files. And I realized I was the first researcher to break the seals in those boxes. And I thought to myself, what a marvelous opportunity. And so I began to, to do research. And you know, it took, uh, took some years to do it, but uh, Blood Runs Coal was the product of that, uh, that momentous day in the Library of Congress. Talking about the assassinations of the 1960s, people today very well still remember the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, JFK, uh, Robert Kennedy. Um, Tell, but but people don't remember, I think, unless you were alive to remember it. I did not know about the story of Jack mm -hmm. Yablonski before I really ran into your book. So perhaps we should back up a little bit and talk about who Jack Yablonski was. Jack Yablonski was a longtime member of the United Mine Workers of America, which at that time in, in 1960s was this country's most powerful labor union, certainly its most influential Yablonski joined the union back in about 1934, and I worked his way up gradually uh, through the ranks to become a head of what was in the 1960s was called District 5, which was southwestern Pennsylvania, which is one of the more powerful districts of the union. And he was also a member of the International Executive Board, which was, like a better way to describe it, the union's College of Cardinals. It advised the president on policy matters. 
Uh, by 69, Yablonsky had become disgusted with the way the union was being run by his then president, Tony uh, Boyle. Yablonsky thought the union was slipping badly. He thought it was turning its back on its members. He thought it was wallowing in corruption. And he decided that it was time for a change. And as I point out in the book, he was greatly influenced. By this time, we're talking about 1969 when he throws his hat in the ring. You have to remember what the country was like then. I mean, the civil rights movement has swept through. There was a lot of anti-Vietnam War protests uh, in 1968. Ted had happened, uh, you know, which, which set the streets of a fire in this country. Yablonsky uh, was very much uh, aware politically of what was going on in the country. And he thought the union was standing still at a time when the rest of the country was moving forward. And it was time to bring the union into what was happening into the country, greater rights more representation for the workers, greater economic benefits, greater health benefits, uh, sick leave, even something like that the union didn't have, um, pensions that, that were actually meaningful. So you know, he, he, he decided it was time to throw his hat in the ring and see whether he could bring some of this about. Unfortunately, uh, it cost him his life. Tell me about the United Mine Workers of America. At, at some point in the story, maybe through most of the story, it's perhaps the most powerful union in america it is it is founded in 1890 in columbus ohio by the time yablonsky uh, is uh is running in 1969 it's probably got somewhere in the neighborhood of 200,000 members even the union doesn't know because they don't bother to keep a roster of how many how many uh men are, are, are belong to it um you can't think of american labor history without the united mine workers of america without john l lewis and the umwa uh there would have been no unions probably in the steel industry, been none in the automobile industry, been none in the rubber industry. They were what were called in the in the 30s and 40s the battering ram of American labor. I mean, they knocked down a lot of doors and and did some very uh, important and, and progressive things uh, in, in, in this country. The, the sad thing about it was, is Lewis stayed on too long, uh, became a bit of a, a dandy himself and and began to turn his back on his members too. And then Tony Boyle just picked up the, 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 the note from, from uh, Lewis and, and did it even more so. So you have what was once a great progressive union begin to decay and rot. And that's what upset Jock Yablonsky so much because he had devoted his life to being a union member. What, what do you mean by picked up the note from, from Lewis? Uh, Tony Boyle picking up the note from, from right. Tony Lewis. What does that mean? What I'm trying to articulate is is that Lewis, by the, the late uh, 1960s, well, he, he, re, he had actually retired in, in, in 1960, which was rare for big labor. But by the time he retired, he had become what was called a labor statesman. Uh, he was as comfortable in corporate boardrooms as he was in the coal fields. And in 1952, Lewis had made a... a a seminal choice, and that choice was that in exchange for allowing the big coal operators to mechanize the coal fields, the coal operators would contribute more money to the union's pension fund. So that meant the union now became interested or as much interested in production as the coal operators did. That cost about 300,000 miners their jobs, and it, 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 it helped accelerate greatly the poverty in, in Appalachia. So even as early as 1952, Lewis is beginning to turn his back on his members. And uh, of course, with increased production comes what? Health risk rocket, skyrocket, especially black lung, especially mining accidents. In fact, in my second chapter of the book, I opened up with a horrific mine accident in West Virginia in, in 1968, November 20th, 1968, that killed 78 miners. Tony Boyle came to the, the scene of the accident and basically praised the union, uh, not the union, sorry, the, the mine owners um, for their safety record with 78 of his members dead inside the mine. So uh, again, you have this turning of, of one's back on, on your membership. Tell me about Tony Boyle. How does he become the leader of the United Mine Workers of America? And and, and I guess there, there's a bit of a, a, an arc, a narrative arc to his to his career as, as the leader of the UNWA. Right. Boyle was born in 1901 in Bald Butte, Montana, which doesn't exist anymore. He came from a long line of, of, of Irish, uh, Scottish um, coal miners. 
Um, he entered the mines when he was nine years old. Uh, watched his father die of black lung when he was a teenager. And realized very quickly, I think, that he'd rather wear a coat and tie than he would uh, some overalls. And he gradually was able to migrate into the administrative side of the union. And he became um, vice president of, of the AFL-CIO chapter out there for the mine workers. 1940, he became head of District 27, which in those days, uh, District 27 of the United Mine Workers, in those days encompassed Montana, the two Dakotas, and Alaska. And he was known for uh, what he called the rough stuff, which meant that he uh, employed physical violence when it was necessary in the interest of the union or himself. And so he came to the attention of Lewis uh, because of he was so aggressive and because he was kind of a no holds barred uh, person. And Lewis brought him to Washington in 1948, basically to be his enforcer. And so Lewis would send him out to some of the worst parts of the coal fields, those that were particularly having uh, having uh, strife with non-union mine owners. And that was always a problem, especially in Kentucky and, and Tennessee. And we know that by 1951, uh, Boyle was trying to employ uh, a, a, a mine worker as an assassin to kill two rival uh, non-union mine operators. So very early on, I mean, Boyle was, was, was one of those guys you did not cross. And if you did, you'd probably pay for it. So by 1960, Lewis is retiring or retired. He has a geriatric successor named Thomas Kennedy, who is basically just a figurehead. Kennedy dies in 1963 of cancer. And Tony Boyle becomes head of the uh, UMWA. And and so his his time as head of the union is actually quite short. I mean, he was always near the top. It, it is. Yeah. It is. He's been in the union for a long time, but actually being president, he's been there from nineteen what sixty three to nineteen seventy two. It, it's interesting when you talk about how sort of tough these guys were, and I think when we think about labor in the middle of the twentieth century, this is kind of the idea that we have of of of, of labor, especially with the auto industry, the mine workers. Right. Et cetera, et cetera. Um, that doesn't come out of nowhere. Uh, there, there, there's a history right. of where you actually had to fight in order to achieve labor right. labor rights. That's right. It's you know, Mitch. It's one of the regrettable things in in in, in this country. The labor history is just not taught. I mean, it, it might be taught at schools like Pitt, maybe Carnegie Mellon, maybe Cornell, but by and large, it's not taught as part of the American experience. And you know, without the labor unions and that, there would be no industrial. America. I mean, the unions built this country, and and it, it is it is a, a very bloody, violent history. I mean that, and and still, I mean today, the unions are on the upswing, but they've always been at best very grudgingly accepted. And now, to be fair, sometimes they've been their own worst enemies, <laughs> such as in this case, or, or cases where where you have people like George Meany, you know, who are, are so anti Vietnam War that they totally miss what's going on in the country and are seen as uh, as fossils. They're no longer relevant to the national debate. And so, yes, I mean, it, 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 there's a reason why, why, why these guys grew up tough, because the circumstances were so tough. I mean, I point out in the book between 1900 and 1969, over 101,000 miners were electrocuted, incinerated, or crushed underground. I mean, the, the mortality rate was awful. And that doesn't even begin to include those who suffered and died from black lung, which, by the way, is on the way back up again. I mean, it's a it's a very difficult, hard life, especially the kind of life that Jock Jablonski lived and Tony Boyle lived. So, yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, it's, it's no wonder that, that these guys were rough, tough guys. Tell me about Black Lung. Well, it, 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 it's awful. I mean, you know, it basically, it's breathing in too much coal dust, and it turns your lungs into like fishing nets. I mean, they, they can't hold air. And so, ultimately, you just choke to death or you suffocate. And, and you get it by being underground and breathing in stuff, uh, coal dust. And, and back in, in, in the day of the book, uh, I mean, the period this book covers, I mean, you've got these huge uh, uh, um, mining machines, continu continuous mining machines that are just running underground and grinding the coal out of the walls of the mines. But you can just imagine the coal dust that those things are kicking up. That was uh, another thing that Yablonski was very upset with. I mean, he 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 knew uh, 
the ravages of what black lung can, can do. And, and, and he was very upset that, that uh, Boyle and, and, and the UMWA hierarchy, UMWA hierarchy at that time, uh, safety was very much a secondary consideration. The main thing was production. Produce as much coal as possible because that meant that more would be contributed to the pension funds and more would be contributed to the miners, the mine union's treasury. So you, you've got this kind of clash of, of interest, the safety of your men or more money. Boyle elected to go for the money. <laughs> this is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Mark A. Bradley. He is the author of the book, Blood Runs Coal, The Oblonsky Murders, and the Battle for the United Mine Workers of America. One of the fi- fascinating aspects I found in this story was the role of Ralph Nader, Mm-hmm. Uh, talk to me about Ralph Nader and his relationship to Jock Yablonski, who would eventually run against Tony Boyle for the leadership of this union. You know, it's easy to forget now what a seminal figure Ralph Nader was in American history. I mean, those of us you know uh, who grew up again in, in that time remember his action against General Motors and, and the unsafe at any speed, the Corvair. And Nader was kind of the first well, not the first, I suppose he's kind of in, in the tradition of Ida Tarbell and the muckrakers and that, but but by that in the 1960s, I mean, he was at the vanguard of consumer safety. And he became very interested uh, touring the coal fields in black lung and in trying to do something legislatively about getting the federal government, Congress to pass black lung laws that would rein in some of the carnage that was happening underground. But Nader realized uh one important fact, and that is that legislation would be worthless unless you had a labor union that was going to stand behind it, was going to actually see that it was enforced. And so that meant to Nader that the union had to have a new head, that it could not be Tony Boyle. So Nader was in Washington, uh, as, as he is now, and, and um, was uh, had worked with a small um, law firm here. And got realized that one of the partners in the law firm was Jock Yablonski's uh, nephew, Stephen Yablonski. And you know, they would talk and Stephen would tell uh, Nader about how upset his uncle was on the way the union was deteriorating and, and what a corrupt uh, figure Tony Boyle was. And Nader uh, knew that he had done enough digging himself and had actually run some articles, uh, had written some articles or done some research that appeared in the post of some letters he had written in the Washington Post here. And he knew exactly what Stephen was talking about. And so he asked uh, Stephen if his uncle might be interested in meeting with him. So Stephen said, I'll talk to my uncle, Jock, and see what he says. And Yablonski was floored, really, because, again, you have to remember what a celebrity Nader was in the 1960s. I he mean, he, was, he so- was considered the most the most trusted man in America. Right, exactly. I mean, this is long before he ran against, you know, uh, Gore and Bush and all, and all that, and perhaps uh, has another reputation in some circles. But back then, he was a, a godlike figure. And Yablonski was just floored at somebody that important would want to talk to him. And so, um, you know, they met, uh, and 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 you know, I think it was during the first meeting. The native point blank asked him, "Would you challenge Tony Boyle?" And Yablonski was just uh, speechless. I mean, that was treason inside the labor union. You didn't do that. I mean, Tony Boyle was the president. They hadn't had a contested election since the 1920s. Hmm. I mean, this just wasn't done. And also, too, uh, Yablonski told Nader, he said, Ralph, you don't understand that if I do this, it'll likely cost me my life. Yablonski knew what he was, the, the stakes of this were extraordinarily high. And it took uh, at least nine meetings between the two men to finally convince Yablonski to do it. By that time, he's 59 years old. He's very close to being able to retire. Um, but there's something that he just can't let go of, and that's the union. He devoted his life to it, and he wanted to see the United Mine Workers recapture some of its old glory. He wanted to see it stand up for the men it was supposed to represent. He wanted to make the union again a power in in the American working class debate. And so on May 29th, 1969, at the Mayflower Hotel here in Washington, he held a uh, press conference where he announced his uh, 
he was going to challenge Tony Boyle. And he did it with a 10 point program, which Nader very heavily uh, was involved in editing. And it was groundbreaking. It included everything from black lung legislation to making the coal companies pay for the environmental carnage they had done in West Virginia and Pennsylvania and, and parts of Appalachia, make them contribute to the school system, make them pay fair taxes. I mean, it was a revolutionary thing in, in, in 1969. But again, if you put it in historical context, Yablonsky is following a, a, you know, a thread that's run through the 60s. Again, we want greater democratization. You know, we want corporate accountability. We, we, we want uh, people to listen. And so this is what this was. What was the campaign like? And, and what, what does it mean to run for the president of oh. the United Mine Workers of America? Well, let me just give you an illustration. Yablonski threw his hat in the ring on May 29th. On June 28th, he's up in Springfield, Illinois, uh, and been invited up there, what he thinks is a friendly group of miners to hear him talk. That meeting, he's bending over a table talking to a miner, and somebody karate chops him in the back of his neck and, and almost kills him. He's, he's, he's knocked unconscious. And it, 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 to the day he dies, he, he has trouble closing his hands, his feet tingle, I mean, it was a, a it was a very savage attack. His doctor said a quarter of an inch, he would have been paralyzed for life or killed. And that's just a month. So, so in, he, he's attacked. Ended. He's yes. attacked on the campaign. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, within a month, he, he he's attacked. You know? and 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 so I mean, you know, he he uh, is recovered enough by July fourth to come to Washington. And as he's out at the um, the um, um, around the Jefferson Memorial, he spies one of uh, Boyle's uh, chief um, lieutenants, and he yells, he says, you're going to have to kill me to get me out of this. You're going to have to kill me to get me out of this. Well, that's exactly what's what, what they're plotting to do. That's exactly what they're plotting to do. What was, was the attack on him in the campaign that almost paralyzed him? Was that at all a, a, a part of the investigation over the over his murder? Do, do you know what it, happened it, there? Who ordered it? It, it was. I mean, it, it, we, we know that the, the, there was a, a suspect named uh, the FBI checked his bank account. There had been a, a hefty deposit in, into it. That attack, though, was separate and apart from the, 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 the assassins who actually brought him down. This was something else. And, and again, it's, it's still not clear whether it was a, a fatal attack or, or whether it was a warning, like, look, you see what we can do to you. You better, if you want uh, to live, you need to get out of this campaign today. And, but it was clear that Yablonski was not going to be intimidated. He was not going to be pushed around. He knew what he was risking and he went on ahead. Do we know if that attack was ordered by Tony Boyle? We do not. Uh, they, 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 there were no, I mean, all the documents I've seen, um, we don't know. We, we know that, that the, the man who uh, was accused of orchestrating it was a Boyle confidant. I, I find it unlikely to believe that this man would have acted on his own. Yeah. Yablonski wasn't murdered until after the election, though. Right. And the election... Yablonski lost to Tony Boyle pretty handedly. Um, By about 40,000 votes, yeah. Yeah. So tell me what happened with the election. Well, uh, Yablonski does, uh, you know, campaigns 20 hours a day, does the you know, barnstorms across uh, the coal fields. But from the beginning, though, it is an uphill fight. I mean, the money he's got to devote to his campaign comes from himself and from his relatives. You know, he, he runs. He takes out an ad in the New Republic uh, to raise money, and the ad cost him more than the money that he brought in. So, I mean, that was that was electioneering back in the 1960s. Boyle, on the other hand, uh, looted the Union Treasury to finance his campaign, and he also did something really remarkable: was that in, in those days, in order to be a, uh, for a Union um, member to get his pension, a retiree to get his pension. He had to still keep his union membership, which meant he had to pay dues. <laughs> and so Boyle still had a fair amount of sway over the pensioners. And what he did is he raised their pensions right before the election from $115 a month to $150 a month. So he got about 73,000 votes that way <laughs> automatically. And for the first time in, in, in union history, the letter that went out was from him to the pensioners 
not from the union. Normally it was from the union. You know, you're getting an increase in your pension. But this time Boyle took personal, personal credit for it. So it, it was David versus Goliath from the beginning. Uh, I mean, um, I, I think that, that um, you know, you raised the point of Yablonsky being murdered after the election. And the reason was, is Yablonsky didn't concede. He was asking for federal intervention under the Landon Griffin Act. He was uh, saying he was going to go before a grand jury and reveal everything he knew about the union's corruption. Mm. And so, um, you know, Boyle had 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 called the plot, told the killers to stand down uh, before the election because he knew he was going to win. And, and so he was just going to wait to see what was going to happen after the election. But as soon as Jablonski refused to concede, the murder plot went back on. And, and so Jablonski had to be taken care of. And also, too, I think it was very important to Boyle to send a strong message that traitors are dealt with in only one way in this union. And if you cross us, then you're doing it at, at, at the risk of, 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 of your life. And I think he wanted to send a very strong message to the membership that this is, you just didn't do that. I mean, it seems to me perhaps the, the, the biggest reason for going through with the murder was because he was getting the Justice Department involved in union affairs. Yeah, that, 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 that's true. Although it, it had been very, very difficult. You got to remember the Nixon administration was no no fan of big labor. Labor hadn't supported him in, in 68. And basically it was a, a laissez-faire type of thing. I mean, as long as the unions are, are, you know, they can do what they want to to each other. I mean, as long as they're not bringing the country down on strikes and that. So, you know, it, it would have been a very, if Yablonski had gone through with his plans, if he hadn't been assassinated, it still would have been, I think, an, an uphill climb. And they had plenty of evidence that the election was stolen. There had been massive fraud. But again, just to get the, the Department of Justice to focus on, on that still would, would have been a steep climb. Let's talk about the assassination of uh, Yablonski. Um, this is, I, I find some real irony here. This is done by three men who were paid to do this. They personally didn't have anything to do with Yablonski. No. Um, from Cleveland. Right. But, but my understanding, I guess this is where the irony comes in. These were men that were affected, actually, by the, the mechanization process of the coals. Uh, of the they mines uh, themselves, who who were who, who lost their jobs because of this, right? That's exactly right. No, I mean, all three. I mean, uh, there were three of them. Paul Gilly, who was the um, one who hired the other two, was from Kentucky. Uh, grew up in the Kentucky slash Virginia coal fields. Uh, Claude Veeley, uh was from West Virginia. Auburn Buddy Martin, West Virginia. They were all product products of of. Um, of this diaspora that happens after Lewis uh, agrees to mechanize the mines. You have S somewhere between, oh, I think the, the most accurate statement would probably be about 3.3 .3 million Appalachians left the coal fields between 1950 and 1969. So that's a huge number of, of, of people moving north. A lot of these people are unskilled or, or semi-skilled, so they, they populate places like Cleveland, Detroit, Akron, Akron Ohio, Muncie, wherever there's light industry, wherever they can work and get out of the coal fields. And so, um, yeah, I mean, there, were, there was a, a, a large, um, um, a lack of a better way to describe it, hillbilly ghetto in, in, in Cleveland. That, and these men were products of that, uh, that, that landscape. You mentioned Paul Gilly. You spent time with him. I spent time with him. Uh, he just died in, in, in July, yeah, 88 years old, as did Richard Sprague, the, the prosecutor. Uh, kind of ironic. They both died within weeks of one another. But yeah, I, I interviewed Paul Gilly at the Albion State Penitentiary up in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, I, I, part of my biography, too, is I was a criminal defense lawyer for eight, eight years. And I, I've represented people in murder cases. So it was like old home day going back into the penitentiary. Uh, so it was nothing I wasn't accustomed to doing. But it was it's still interesting uh, or, or, or in, in a chilling way to sit across from somebody who were responsible for the murders of three people. Tell me about the murder itself. Well, it, it, there were, let's, including the, the, the attempt in Springfield, and again, that's separate from the murders, uh, the actual killings. There were nine attempts on Yablonski's life, uh, and the last one was successful. Um, what happens is, is that there is uh, a great push after Yablonski won't stand down, won't concede, get him off the scene. 
And so uh, the three killers are told no uncertain terms. They have to get it done or their contract or no, no, no written contract, but their contract was going to be pulled. And they were terrified that they were going to have to refund what money they had been given. They had spent most of it already. And also, too, that they may be killed themselves uh, because they knew too much. So what they did is they um, they drove down to uh, Clarksville, Pennsylvania, where the murders took place. I've been inside the house. It's a very chilling place. There's still a bullet hole upstairs in the bedroom where Yablonski was shot uh, in the head. For 40 years uh, later or, or 50 years later. Yep. yep. It's like a time capsule. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's was, I mean, talk about spooky. Uh, but anyway, they, they go to uh, Clarksville on December uh, 30th. And and they uh, in no uncertain terms uh, this time, uh, they know they've got to get it done. And there's one very powerful ingredient they've got this time. They've got with them Auburn buddy Martin, who's brand new to the plot. Martin is in his early 20s. He's extraordinarily uh, got a hair trigger temper, uh, very violent. Um, he was once thrown out of a bar in Cleveland and came back with a machine gun and raked the bar. Uh, not a man to cross at all. And he, Martin wants money. He's, he's, he's broke. He needs cash. He knows this is an easy way to get it. So he goes, uh, joins the plot. Uh, the third man that they did have dropped out. And so they need a replacement. So anyway, they go to Clarksville. And in the early morning hours of December 31st to New Year's Eve, 1969, they uh, creep up the driveway. Uh, they take the one of the doors off the hinges, uh, take their shoes off, creep up the steps. Uh, Martin heads into Charlotte Yablonski's bedroom, the 25-year-old daughter, and Claude Vealy and Gilly go into where the parents are sleeping next door. The rooms are actually side by side. And um, Martin shoots first, shoots Charlotte in the back of the head twice, um, kills her instantly. This is the child. Yeah, well, she's 25, but yeah, the, the daughter. Their child, and, I should say. Yeah, 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 exactly. And and that, that wakes up the parents. Margaret Yablonski screams when she sees two men standing in her door. Gilly raises up a rifle to shoot him, pulls the trigger. He pulls the wrong uh, wrong mechanism on the rifle, and instead he ejects the clip so it falls on the floor. She starts continuing to scream. Yablonski begins to get out of bed. He's got two rifles. He's got two guns in the room. He's got a twenty two rifle up against the wall, and he's got a shotgun uh, on the other wall. Un Yablonski, when he was 13 years old, uh, had been playing with a pistol uh, as a young teenager and accidentally shot and killed a friend of his. Because of that, he abhorred guns, hated them. And both these guns that he's got in his room are unloaded. So anyway, when his wife starts screaming, he gets out of bed, realizes immediately, must have realized immediately what was happening, began to grope for the shotgun shells. Gilly picks up the rifle from Vic Vealy, uh, takes a rifle from Beely, shoves the clip back in, shoots uh, Margaret once in the shoulder. Buddy Martin then comes in and empties four shots into the parents, kills Margaret instantly, and then badly wounds uh, Jock Yablonski. Beely then takes the gun from Martin, reloads it, and shoots Yablonski some more. By the time it's over, Yablonski has been shot five times. The killers then... Um, look for some money to steal. They, they go through the dressers and that. They want to make it look like a robbery uh, that went bad. And they also wanted to get, get some extra cash that they could. They, they take uh, some money from Yablonski's dresser. They find nothing in Charlotte's room. They go back down the steps, put on their shoes, and uh, leave and head back to Cleveland. Along the way, they throw out you know, their gloves, the, the wire cutters they would used, I mean, various tools and then head back to uh, Cleveland. They get back to Cleveland on uh, you know, um, New Year's Eve, and they immediately um, begin to spend the money on, on alcohol and, uh, and, and women. And so for just under $5,000, they've snuffed out three lives. Do you know why, or did you even ask Paul Gilly, why, why Charlotte? Their 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 twenty five year old well, child who was in a, a different room. It's interesting. The men did not wear masks when they went inside the house, which leads me to believe that no one was going to be allowed to, to get out. They'd also disabled the cars, so no one was going to be able to identify them. 
Charlotte had finished up uh, a job as a social worker and an economic director in West Virginia in one of these coalfield counties and was looking very much forward to going to Washington, D.C. to learn how to make policy. Actually, she realized being a social worker, which she loved, was great, but to actually have real impact, Washington, D.C. was where legislation was crafted. So if you're going to alleviate poverty in that, come to Washington. So she was merely home waiting to start another job. She'd finished working on her dad's campaign and was just within probably days of being able to come to Washington and just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And if the killers had been more proficient, they would have killed Yablonski before uh, and not in the house, but on the campaign trail and they'd stalked him. But thanks to their ineptitude and awful, awful luck, Charlotte is in the, uh, the home the night that these three break in. So she's what they would call collateral damage in the worst sense. How, how long is it until they get caught and how well, do we connect the story from their murder of, of Yablonski, his wife and his daughter uh, to that of Tony Boyle, the president of the well, union? It, it's, it's a, it's a torturous uh, road. I mean, it, it's, 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 it takes uh, Richard Sprague five trials to finally do it. But what happens is, when the killers get back, uh, they they are flush with money, and and people notice that they are flush with money. People who didn't have much money before are now flush with it. And uh, Martin gets drunk and starts bragging about you know some of what, what he had done. And uh, one of the the other men in the plot was a guy named Charles uh, Charles Phillips, and James Charles Phillips, and he is 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 terrified that somehow some way he's going to be linked to these murders again he had dropped out of the plot but he was terrified so he goes to see paul gilly and gilly basically threatens to kill him if he says anything so phillips tells his uncle i mean what happened and his uncle says you know you've got to go to the fbi and i mean and, and tell them what you know and, and by the way there's also a nice hefty reward out there that you may be able to get if you turn on these guys. So Phillips goes to the bureau, uh, I think it's on uh, January 17th, and begins to talk. And so the bureau very quickly is able to wrap up these three and then arrest them. And so first one who stands trial, um, well, let me back up. Claude Vealy on uh, January 21st agrees to cooperate with the FBI. Now here you've got one of the main players, in fact, one of, one of the shooters, actual shooters, confessing uh, to the murder plot. And so thanks to Bealey's confession, we were able to wrap up uh, Gilly and, 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 and Gilly's wife and Silas Huddleston, her father-in-law, who talked Gilly into doing this and, 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 and all that. So anyway, now Richard Sprague uh, is chosen by the state of Pennsylvania to prosecute the case. Sprague at that time was the first assistant district attorney in Philadelphia. He is a graduate of Temple. He graduated from Penn Law School, which he did not like. I didn't like law school at all. And uh, became a public defender. I worked for a small firm, bored, bored him to death, became a public defender. And he was so successful beating the DA's office in cases they hired him as a prosecutor. And he loved the courtroom. By the time he takes the Yablonski murder case, he, he's tried over 15,000 criminal cases, 450 murders among those, and he's gotten 63 first-degree murder convictions. He's absolutely lethal in the courtroom. I mean, F. Lee Bailey once said if he were in trouble, Richard Sprague would be the attorney he would hire to, to defend him. So Sprague is a master of the courtroom. And Sprague very systematically, very methodically starts to chain. You go from the low to the top. And, you know, Gradually, by, by, by confessions and, and, and by putting the heat on people, he's able to uh, take the case all the way up to uh, the Tony Boyle, who he convicts in 1974, I think it is. And, and, and then they're, they're, Boyle appealed multiple times and, and, and eventually died in uh, the penitentiary in, in Pennsylvania. It, it, does he remain president of the union all the no. way up to his conviction? He's defeated in 19... He, I'm sorry, he's defeated in 1972 by Arnold Miller. One of the great uh, aspects of this story is, is, is that Yablonski's blood, in a way, helps to wash the union clean. It's an awful, awful price to pay. But Yablonski's sons, uh, 
Chip Yablonski, who lives over here in Bethesda, uh, still alive. His brother Kenneth, who's not, refused to let their father's uh, dreams of a of a clean union die. And so they, along with Joe Rao, who had been Yablonski's lawyer, Rao was one of the great civil rights lawyers of the 1960s. And um, th those members of the union who were so uh, in, so upset about what had happened to Yablonski, just so floored by the fact that, that the union could be accused of murdering not only Yablonski, but also two innocent women, galvanized. And uh, they were finally able to, Yablonski's death did something that, that Yablonski alive couldn't do. He galvanized the federal government, Department of Labor, and Department of Justice to intervene in the election to make sure that the election in 1972 was clean. Hmm. And even though with all that federal firepower at the election, Arnold Miller was only able to win by 14,000 votes. But I don't mean to diminish uh, Miller's accomplishments. I mean, that was the first time in American history that the rank and file workers have been able to over to to win and, 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 and take control of a major American labor union. So it was a first. This is this is the rise of miners for democracy. That's correct. Yeah, and this would be the first successful rank and file takeover of a union in U.S. history. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, again, it was an awful price to pay to get to that point, but they were a able to do it. The relationship between Jacques Yablonski and Ralph Nader became complicated near the end. It did. It did. You know, un unfortunately, I know as an historian or as a lawyer. Um, there are no transcripts of, of, of what the two men said to one another during all those meetings. Yablonski always, always claimed that, that Ralph uh, Nader offered him a lot more in terms of help. Nader always told me, and I interviewed Nader, that at that time he had many causes going on and that he was clear that, that he would help Yablonski get publicity, help get the calls advertised, but he didn't raise money. He didn't campaign. That's not what he did. I mean, he was, uh, you know, a, a, a crusader, but not a, didn't get down and in, in, do the weeds on this stuff. Yablonski's son, Chip, believes adamantly to this day that his father never would have run, but for, for Nader's uh, involvement. And, you know, I, I mean, I suspect both men heard what they wanted to hear. Uh, Yablonski was probably a bit starstruck and thought that with Nader's backing, he could, could do it. Um, but again, Nader at that time, as, as you said yourself, was one of the most famous men in the country. And had been on pages of Time, uh, cover of Time, Life magazine. I mean, he was a celebrity. He's founded and, dozens of organizations. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Clean water, clean air. You mind mine workers was just one thing. I mean, it was an important thing, and I don't want to diminish Nader's uh, achievements because, you know, I, I mean, Nader was one of the very first to focus in on black lung, the very first to focus in on the union's corruption. I mean, with, without Nader, you, what you can argue, even though, you know, you could take this to its final conclusion i mean he's somewhat responsible for what happened in 1972 but again it comes at an awful price that nobody nader nor yablonsk well yablonsk i'll take that back i i honestly believe and one of the reasons why i think uh, this is such an interesting story it's got a it's almost like a great tragedy in a way where yablonsk predicts the outcome uh, i mean he sees what the way this is probably going to end he never thought in his wildest dreams that the union would kill his or, or the, that his daughter and wife would be sacrificed too. I think he fully expected uh, either not to live or to be badly hurt during the campaign. It's just the way the union worked. And and so, um, I mean, I I, I just it's it, it's it's a it's a great it's, to me it's 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 a story worthy of a Greek tragedy. That characters are somewhat Shakespearean and 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 in what they are, who they are, and you know, I I, I it was a tremendously uh, interesting book to write. Um, tragic as it was, I thought it was important to, to tell this part of American history and, and to not let Jock Yablonski's memory just fade. In your meetings with Paul Gelly, did, did, did he ever express remorse for the killings? No. The only thing he expressed remorse over was being in prison for as long as he was. And in fact, it, it, it's ironic. Uh, it, I, I got it, um, from the DA's office back in, in July after Gilly died, um, he was filing another petition for clemency. They'd be claiming again that he had stayed downstairs. He didn't shoot anybody. You know, it was strictly up to Billy and, and Martin. But never mind the felony murder rule. Where if, 
you know, if you're participating in a felony and somebody's killed, you're as guilty as the guy who pulled the trigger. I mean, we just went through, through that down in Georgia, in, in Brunswick, uh, you know, in that trial. But, but yeah, I mean, it, it, no, but he had uh, no remorse. He, he had, and I think, talked himself into a story that, that you know, by the time he died, he, he may well have believed. Mark A. Bradley has been our guest. He is the author of the book, Blood Runs Coal, The Oblonsky Murders, and The Battle for the United Mine Workers of America. Mark Bradley, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you, Mitch. It was a real pleasure to talk to you and to your audiences out out in the uh, the West Coast.